Hi everyone, I'm Alistair Benn and this is Vision and Light. This week, when we talk about award-winning memorable landscape and nature photography, one name really comes to mind and that is Marcel Van Oosten. I'm honoured to be speaking to him again this week. Uh, we met quite a few years ago in China, just randomly bumping into each other beside a temple in uh, Yunnan province. Uh, and it was just amazing to meet the guy who I'd known online for about 15 or 16 years before that. Him and I kind of grew up in the same kind of uh, time, the mid 2000s, and we were both, both posting on the same type of forums. And he started his company Squiver with his partner Daniela and has gone on to produce this incredibly successful business and a stream of just incredible photographs. We talked a lot about his attention to detail, his precision, his striving for individuality and his creativity. Uh, and it was just really interesting to have a relaxed conversation with him in his home in South Africa and me here in the west of Scotland. And we just had a nice friendly chat full of, full of anecdotes and memories, uh, plus a, a lot of focused attention on his method and his approach to the landscape and his natural subjects as well. So, uh, please enjoy the next 45 minutes or so with myself, Alistair Ben, talking to Marcel Van Oosten on Vision and Light. Marcel, nice to see you again after all these years. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you, Alistair, for inviting me. You're welcome. You're welcome. I was scratching my brain the other day and it was something like just over three, around about three years ago exactly that we bumped into each other in China. That was weird, eh? It was. <laughs> it was like, we didn't know. And I... And I, I didn't like really recognize you because you, it was cold and we all had these big jackets and everyone had a hat on and, but um, yeah, I, I, I thought like, he sounds like familiar. And then I started looking and then I saw your girlfriend and I thought, oh, that also looks familiar. Yeah, I mean, what are the odds on the other side of the planet it, in, it was in really China bizarre. of all places. That's right. I think what happened was, if I recall rightly, there'd been a big storm, there'd been a big snowstorm and a lot of the high altitude uh, roads were blocked mm -hmm. and we'd had to change our plans to, um, we couldn't go where we wanted to go. So we'd, we'd doubled back down to uh, Shangri-La and I think you'd, you'd had something similar that you couldn't get where you wanted to go, I think. To be honest, I don't remember. <laughs> no, I only remember that we bumped into each other and that I thought it was bizarre. Well, that was, it was bizarre, but it was very nice to meet you. Um, Likewise. It was something, it was one of those weird things because uh, like we were saying before we, we started recording here, I think we've been aware of each other for quite a long time. I mean, we were both on a forum back in the mid 2000s and something I always recall about your work was it was so recognizable. It was, there was just, there was just something, uh, I think the way I described it was that it was just like, I was seeing a new vision of the world every time you posted an image, whether it was from Death Vlay or from the deserts of Egypt or familiar places like Arches National Park, you always managed to find a new twist uh, in your landscape photography. How much of that was a conscious, kind of desire to stand out and be different or was it just a kind of the ideas that came to you when you were in those places I would say it's probably both um, <clears throat> and there's there's a, a, always a large part of me that tries to be different within like some very narrow guidelines that I set for myself um, and to explain I'll tell a little bit about my um, uh, about my history. Uh, so I started in art school and then in art school, I, um, I studied graphic design and, uh, and art direction. Um, I had the option to study photography as well, but at that time I didn't like it at all. So I was, 
I'm totally not interested in photography, so I I, <laughs> I dropped that straight away, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then I um, uh, after I did art school, I uh, I got my first job as an art director in advertising. Now in advertising, everything is about ideas. So basically, I I sat in a little uh, in a little office with my copywriter, and uh, for the entire day we we, we would be like brainstorming. Uh, back and forth, um, coming up with creative ideas for uh, to solve all kinds of marketing problems. Um, the one thing that I learned in my you know, in my career in advertising was to be original. That actually was so important that uh, the worst thing you could do in advertising was to come up with an idea that had already already been um, used before somewhere right. else on the planet and to make matters worse um in advertising you also had um like these award shows like you have for photography as well so like for the best advertising but they also had an award show um that was more like a name and shame award show okay and <laughs> and that was for um you could, if you want something, that was like like in the movies. You have to what is it called the raspberries or something. Oh, I don't That's know. For, I, I, for I, the I'm, worst, I'm, yeah, it's okay. like it's like the opposite of the Oscars. Where if you win that, that you win the worst movie. Okay. And then for, so in advertising, we had something similar, and um, that was for if if you created something, an advertising idea, and it has had already been done before, then you were immediately nominated for okay. that award so the first award that i ever won was that award <laughs> so <laughs> for an ad campaign that i did for uh, for honda honda uh, cars so i did uh, i did i worked in advertising for 15 years oh wow and so for for 15 years as an art director i was totally obsessed with creating stuff that is original and okay. that has not been done before so that has become like a second nature for me. And that basically um, now determines everything that I do because whatever, whatever it is that I, that I do, especially with photography, my first instinct is always, what can I do to make it original? Which doesn't mean revolutionary original, like completely out of the box and something uh, that no one has ever seen before but always thinking about little things that I can change uh, to make it different, to make it my own. Right. So right from the get-go, that is, that is something that I already, uh, what did I always start with? So every project that I start, uh, an essential part of it is trying to figure out what has already been done so how has this subject been photographed before? And uh, that tells me two things. It tells me what I can expect. So if the subject is new, then I learn um, what I can do with it. Uh, but it also, it also shows me what has already been done before. So then I try to stay away from that and try to change little things. And very often, like do little brainstorms, trying to come up with ways to photograph something that is just a little bit different than uh, what's already out there. That's really so interesting. That's, that, that's really interesting because I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to speak to people from, I mean, a lot of Americans, you know, you know Mark Adams and Sean Bagshaw and Alex Noriega, Guy Tao, well, Guy Tao, kind of American now, I guess. But equally, you're the second Dutch photographer I've spoken to. Mm. So I was speaking to Theo Bosboom uh, a few weeks ago. And Theo and you, I think, apart from both being giants of men, <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you both share an incredible attention to detail uh, in, in your work. Uh, you know, there's something all, there's, a, there's a, a real feeling of precision about your work. Um, and I think, I know that there's an awful lot of serendipity in landscape photography as well. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the screen now and seeing images from Huang San and places like that. And the way the mist flows around the mountain peaks is obviously serendipitous. Mm. You can, you've got no control over that. But the way you compose your images and the way you present your work, 
uh, it seems, it just seems there's a, there's a very high level of perfection in it. Well, I'm happy that you see it that way because that's, that's exactly how I work. Yeah. Um, extremely detailed and, um, everything is about the tiniest, tiniest little things in the, uh, in the images. So very often, actually, I spent a lot of time, uh, with very small elements in the frame. And even though most of the time, most people actually don't really see what I've been, what I've been doing. And, um, I, I have a small anecdote about it. Um, so like a couple of years ago, I won the overall title in the wildlife photographer of the year with an image of two, uh, two snub nosed monkeys in China. I'm well aware and, of those, yes. Yeah, and then, um, so the, when I was preparing images for, uh, for my entry, uh, that, that particular image I also looked at, and there were so many things in that image that I didn't like, all tiny little things that um, when I added them all up, I thought it's probably better if I don't enter it because it would require me to to remove, like clone out a, little, a lot of tiny little things. And especially with the wildlife tour of the year, that's not allowed. So okay. they, don't allow, they don't allow any cloning of that kind. So it has to stay pure. And, um, but I, I, I like cloning quite a bit. So I wanted to really tidy up the image. And then I looked at it and all I saw was clutter. All I saw was distractions. And I thought, well, if I have to enter this, it just, it doesn't feel like a hundred percent like me because right. I, I would never, I would actually never do that. And then, um, I decided, well, what the hell let's, let's try it anyway. So I tried to remove all those elements, not by cloning, but by dodging and burning, right. so I'm making certain areas darker and other brighter to sort of obscure the distractions. And then that's, so that image won. And uh, I was extremely surprised because uh, for me, it's, I mean, obviously I like that image, um, but there's so much wrong, like <laughs> there's so much wrong with that image for me as an artist. When I, when I look at it, I see so many little things that I would have loved to change. But now I realize that, you know, what's the point? Because people like it anyway. Uh, well, I think, that, I mean, obviously I have a point of view about these things. And I think the reason I don't start off with a checklist of questions is I think there's so much more insight to be gained from exploring little rabbit holes of opportunity mm. that come up in the conversation. Um, and the one there you've talked about is, I think as photographers, we tend to obsess over perfection an awful lot of the time. Um, and we are aware of all these tiny little distractions within the frame because we know what the photograph's about, mm. you know, the, in, in that case, you know, the golden yeah. monkeys and, you know, they were just so luminous and, and so beautifully lit within the scene um, that all of these little points of light are distractions, but most people tend not to see them. But as mm. you said, I mean, by doing the dodging, uh, the dodging and burning, you know, just to kind of eliminate them, it's just such a consciously simple way of doing it is, is right. to just, you know, either make something brighter or something darker and it just leads mm. the eye through the frame. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's that marriage of craft and aesthetics, I think, really. Mm. But, um, yeah, but it, was a, it was a learning experience in a sense that uh, I really realized that the things that I spent so much time on, um, or maybe, maybe the vast majority of people actually don't, don't really see all that effort that I've no, done. No. Uh, um, and still, I, I, I can't let it go. I just, I have to do it. And it's the main, it's the main reason that I'm so super slow at processing. It's, it's like, like terribly slow. And it's just because like, I'm constantly like a little bit this, a little bit that, and it takes forever. And then sometimes I, and then I see other people processing and they spend like half an hour and they create something so beautiful. And I think like, Hmm, well, he didn't, he didn't like spend so much time on all the tiny little details, but still I can't, I can't help well, it. I think there's also a part of your work where you're processing for big print 
you know, I, I think there's, there's a very different mentality processing for something like on your wall, you know, which is what, you know, two meters or something like that. Yeah. If you're processing for that, you can't afford to let these little things slide. Uh, right. By the time it's on the wall, it's too damn late, mm. you know, whereas mm. if you're just processing for a 1500 pixel image on, on social media, then you can do yeah, it in, true. do it in five minutes. I think a lot of the time, most true, of my yeah. processing is super, super quick. I, I tend not to take a long time really, yeah. un unless I, it's something I really care about and I'm, and I'm genuinely wanting to pour my heart into it. But a lot of the time my processing is by five, five, 10 minutes. You know, it's, it's oh, wow. really, really quite quick. Uh, I'm so jealous now. Oh, uh, you've got nothing to be jealous about. I can <laughs> assure you of that. So in terms of, um, you know, you've, you've kind of talked about this level of precision and perfection. How is your time in, I presume you're like the rest of us, you're kind of locked down at the moment. I mean, mm. I, I presume your spring tours would have been uh, cancelled or postponed or whatever. How are you coping with the whole lockdown situation? And is it changing your thoughts about moving forward and your relationship with the landscape and maybe what you want to focus on or try and achieve with your, the rest of your career? Well, obviously it's a, a very weird situation and this is, uh, my situation is probably not very different from yours or most other photographers. Uh, we're very much used to traveling all over the planet, like constantly. So it's strange to be uh, locked up in your home suddenly. Um, but there's really two sides to this. Uh, one is that it's, 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 it's kind of stressful that we, well, we basically had to cancel almost all our tours for this year. And since that's our main source of income, knowing that there won't be any income for the rest of the year is uh, obviously not a very nice, uh, cheerful thought. Um, on the other side, I'm really, really enjoying my time at home now. <laughs> and as much as as much as I like, <laughs> as much as I like traveling, and as much as I like uh, taking photographs, I'm like super enjoying my time at home because uh, usually I don't have time at all for uh, like a ton of things. Uh, one of them being processing, actually, because we're constantly like. Uh, traveling and shooting and uh, usually the only images that I process are the images that I I can still remember so there's usually every trip there's like uh, three or four images that I can still like remember because I knew when I shot them I knew oh this is really good so then when I get back home I, I, I process those and the rest you know I don't have time to look at the rest so and then I and it's on to the next trip and that means that I have, I have so many images that I've like barely looked at. And now suddenly for the first time, I have a lot of time. And now I'm going through like folders from Iceland 2011. <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and it's like Christmas because I've, it's like, I, it's, so long, it's so long ago that I, I can hardly remember that I've actually photographed that. So I'm looking at all these images and it's like all these little presents and some of them are like really nice. <laughs> and so, and then suddenly I have the time to, to yeah. actually process them. So, so that's really good. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm super enjoying that. So if it weren't for the, uh, the financial uh, challenges that uh, this lockdown uh, creates for, for us and for a lot of other people, um, yeah, I, I, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. we're the same. I, I, I've, I've just had suddenly all this time. I mean, this whole vision and light thing that started with Adam Gibbs and myself and hmm. to talk to you and Guy Tal and Mark Adamus and everyone else. Uh, it's, it's, we just don't have time for that normally. I mean, trying to pin you down to have a chat under normal circumstances yeah. would be all but impossible. Um, yeah. So yeah, we, we're enjoying that a lot and I'm writing a book and, you know, getting on with that and, so yes, I agree that that, that is the, the plus side of it. But yes, not having our workshops for the autumn, I think is looking quite sketchy as well. Um, well yeah, I think so, yeah. It's, uh, oh. we've got a lot in the autumn as well. And it's, um, anyway, we won't get too heavily focused on that no. side of things. Um, so in terms of, um, 
do you think that there's going to be a, a shift in your appreciation for what you get to do? I mean, do you, are you one of these guys that just knows you're lucky uh, in terms of with the opportunity that you have to do what you do? You know, because sometimes I think we take it for granted that we get to do this when most people would think it's like the dream oh, job okay. of the world. No, I've never taken it for granted. Actually, uh, uh, my wife, Daniela, and I, we make it a habit to uh, uh, regularly like, look at each other uh, when we're traveling and, um, and realize that we're extremely fortunate that uh, this is our job and that this is, this is what we do. And um, yeah, we're super fortunate. Yeah, so I've, we didn't need a pandemic or a lockdown to realize that we were that we're, that we're actually lucky, yeah. Even now, even now, we still consider ourselves extremely lucky. Mm. Oh, totally. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, I'm I'm in exactly the same position. That's uh, it's yeah. I, I was just saying to Anne this, this this morning that we've got the best job in the world. And even if you're tired and run down and feel exhausted, mm. and, you know, you, it's still an incredibly fortunate thing to do. Um, in terms of we've we've talked about your background in advertising and the impact that that's had upon the the sort of need or practice of being individual. Mm. Um, how do you think that balances in a world that's getting smaller and busier with photographers? Uh, you know, is there is it getting harder for you to feel as if you're get you're staying ahead of the game, or do you find it much harder? I mean, you you recently did that project in off Yemen. Uh, mm. You know, that's not somewhere that comes up in many photo no. <laughs> photo blogs very often. No. Uh, and you've been to some really other insane places, like the you know the western deserts of Egypt and. You know, mm. you, you seem to get into some crazy places. Is it harder to do that now than it was a decade ago? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, unfortunately, I would, uh, there's just a ton of countries that are very high on my list, uh, but it's just, it's impossible to go there because there's just too much risk. Yeah. And um, I think it was in 2000, eight or nine that Daniela and I went to the to the Sahara. We did a very long project there in Algeria, in Libya, in Chad, Egypt. And um, already back then it was it was quite sketchy. So the, when we arrived in Algeria, there was a national park where we wanted to go. And just on the day they told us, well, better not go there because uh, Al Qaeda in the Maghreb is there. So uh, better go somewhere else. And even in Chad, we had to camp in ditches and behind rocks right. to not attract any attention from uh, bandits and stuff. But, uh, but since then, actually, the situation has gotten so much worse um, in Northern Africa because of the Arab Spring, which yes. turned out to be an Arab nightmare. And, but in a lot of countries, just because of uh, uh, extremists, uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim extremists, uh, and unfortunately, that's where a lot of the places are that I really like. So I really enjoy deserts. I really enjoy rock formations, and I just know that uh, the best ones that I would like to return to are in countries that are just unsafe to travel in, mm. and. Um, we a couple of years ago we decided to go to Iran, which is also yep. like not the most obvious choice for most. Uh, um, and then yeah, last year I, last year I went to I went to Socotra, which is an island off the coast of Yemen, which had been at the top of my list for many many years. But uh, there's like a, a perpetual civil war going on there, yeah. uh, which uh, which which constantly made it impossible. Um, I'm not easily scared, so I, I, I constantly tried. So I even tried to go with a, like a, a cement ship uh, that departed from Oman, <laughs> which is go with the, with the ship, but that that turned out to be impossible. And then I tried to I tried to get a, like a higher, like a, a, a small Cessna, 
to fly mm -hmm. from Oman straight to the island. But uh, that was that turned out to be also too too costly actually. Right. And then and then suddenly I heard about the opportunity to go there, and that's when I decided to do, go uh, to do it like immediately, even though still that is considered uh, uh, yeah well dangerous because obviously there's a still a massive war going yeah. on in uh, in Yemen. Uh, uh, but yeah, I'm um, I'm attracted to those kind of places that are uh, still relatively undiscovered mm. um, because I, I like that part of uh, the nature experience to to that feeling that you get when you're then when you walk somewhere or you hike somewhere knowing that probably no other photographer has ever set foot there um, that's really nice feeling uh, that's also part I think of the of the reason why a lot of uh, photographers you like yourself uh, feel so attracted to nature photography and landscape photography is that experience. So it's not only about capturing the imagery, but it's also the, uh, the, the, the being outdoors and just sniffing that, uh, that fresh air and yeah. uh, exploring. Something that's coming up, I think what, what's been striking to me talking to quite a diversity of professional landscape photographers because so far in, in this series everyone pretty much makes their, their full-time living out of photography mm. uh, later on in the series i will be talking to people with other careers who are very serious uh, landscape photographers but up until now everyone makes all their income from it and there's something that's always been coming up now is there's a there's a conflict somewhere along the line between just us being a bunch of kids running around in the landscape having a whale of a time and just being out there because we love being out of there hmm. and then on the flip side of the coin you've got running a business being a grown-up being very responsible uh, professional uh, hmm. understanding how to run a business understanding marketing understanding um balancing popularity versus personal creative freedom and all of this stuff how do you balance that how do you which bit of marcel get you know how does how does business marcel interact with uh 12 year old marcel <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, i don't think it's 12 year old marcel it's probably 16 16 year old okay. marcel yeah <laughs> yeah well uh, that, that voice is super important because um, that's where you get all your energy from. So that uh, so that that little voice that just only wants to do all the fun stuff. That's actually a very important voice. Um, so that's um, yeah. That's, so that's a, a driving force be, behind uh, everything that I do. And um, when I was working in advertising, uh, uh, you know, I had a very good salary because advertising at that time paid very well. And uh, same goes for Daniela. And then uh, after, a, after, it took me a lot of time actually to realize that um, making a lot of money is not going to make you happy. And it's like a, a, a very famous um, Dutch soccer player, Johan Cruyff, once said, uh, money is not going to make you happy. It's going to make you happier. And so that's, that's, that's what we realize, you know, it's, uh, it's, it does make our life easier and uh, uh and uh, uh, enables us to do a lot of uh, nice stuff but it doesn't make us like really happy per se no. so um when i decided that i wanted to uh, change careers and move into nature photography uh, i realized that uh it was probably going to be super hard and that uh it was basically going to be a change from uh, being very comfortable with a very good salary to making ends meet and um, but at the time um, it was a very conscious choice to uh, choose for the lifestyle and not for the income so then I decided you know it's better that I can do the stuff that I love and uh, that I have a passion for and then not make all that money than to make all that money and drag myself out of bed every day yeah. and, uh, and just be stressed out every day and then the one thing that uh, Daniela and I decided together, because we decided, okay, we're going to start this like photography.
photography company, uh, the both of us, and we're going to try to turn it, turn it into a profitable business. The one thing that we promised each other is that we were only going to do stuff that makes us happy. And we have been, I think we've been pretty good at, at doing that so far. So um, we get the majority of our income from running tours. We've been doing that for us for a very, very long time. Uh, we started back in the days when there was very few people actually doing that around the world. It was, I think right. it was 2006 I stopped, so 2007. Yeah, and um, so what we've been doing uh, ever since actually is instead of picking a, a, a tour location that I know is going to be very profitable, like a, a, a good financial um, choice, actually I, I, I don't uh, I don't pay attention to that at all. Uh, the only thing that I do is I I pick locations that I love myself. So because the, the rationale behind it is, is pretty simple that if I'm going to take a group of people to a, to a place and I'm going to, I'm going to show them around and I'm going to teach them about photography. And I, I want to do that in a very, in a very passionate way. I need to be really passionate about that location and sure. about the subject that we're going to photograph. And the only way I can I can do that is to visit locations and photograph subjects that I have a real passion for myself. Mm. So whenever I feel like, okay, I've I've been here now so many times, even though this particular location, this, this particular tour is very profitable for us, um, we just kill it, just because it's just. I, I'm, I, I find it hard to right. uh, to motivate myself and to be inspired. And the moment I'm no longer inspired, it becomes impossible to also inspire other people. So, um, so that's a very long answer to your to your question. Mm -hmm. That uh, that's basically how I still work. Like uh, I I really feel inspired by something. I really want to go somewhere. I really love a certain subject and that makes me want to go there and that makes me want to photograph it. And that's usually when I decide to turn it into a tour. Right. And, um, so that's how I ended up in, uh, in Socotra. And that was not because I wanted to run tours there because that's probably, uh, it's pr probably not a very wise idea <laughs> anyway, but uh, <laughs> it's just because I really wanted to, to, to photograph there and right. because of the landscape and because of, of the trees they have there. Yes. The so tiger. that's, that's my, that's my driving force. And, um, uh, that's, and that, and that goes for everything. So it also goes for my processing, uh, also goes for image selection. I process the way that I like it. And even though I'm extremely aware of what sells, uh, what doesn't sell. Uh, I know this very, very well because that's how also I was trained in advertising. I've, right. I've been on that side. So I've, I've been an art director and I've been working with photographers myself. I've been picking photographers to photograph for me. And um, so I know what sells and I know what people like, uh, but still it's, a, it's totally irrelevant, irrelevant for me when I, when I photograph and when I process because... I'm only thinking about what what I like myself, which is basically um, a reaction to everything that I've done in my previous career. Because when I worked in advertising, there was always this, uh, there was always the client. And the client told me like, this is my problem and you, and you need to solve it. And then I started thinking about all kinds of creative ideas. And then, but in the end it was the client who had like the, set, the last say in it. So the, yeah. the, the client was the one who decided like, well, no matter how nice this concept is for the, this television commercial or for this billboard that you came up with, and no matter how funny it is or how uh, thoughtful, uh, I don't like it, so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna kill it. So you go back to the drawing board and you start all over again. So I've, I've done that for 15 years and I got like totally fed up with it that Right. Your creativity is limited in so many ways because of, uh, because of that client relationship that's so important. So that's one of, the, one of the things that I promised myself that 
in my new career, I'm going to be extremely uh, uh, careful where it where it is um, um, when it's about uh, how do you call it um, assignments. Right. So like a lot of people, uh, a lot of photographers like to get assignments. And actually the first thing I did in the early days of my career was to actually hold off assignments. Like when there was a, I remember very vividly, there was like a, a National Geographic traveler approached me and they wanted me to, uh, to go to Ireland to shoot for them. And um, I thought about it and I thought, well, it, like it's a beautiful brand and it's going to look really good on my, uh, on my CV. And, and then I decided, no, I'm not going to do it because I'll be, I'll be right back in that same spot where I didn't want to be. Right. So I said, well, it's probably not a good idea. I, I, I really don't enjoy that, uh, that assignment uh, sort of um, uh, feeling. And at that, at that early stage in my career, I decided, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, it's only later, like much, much later, that I decided uh, that I'm ready for it again. Yes, you did some notable work recently with Nikon, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, something that's, you know, I just want to summarize a couple of things because you brought up so many points in in the last five yeah. or ten minutes. Um, and, you know, I think some of the things, I, again, you know, for people who are listening to this, because there's people who are professional photographers listening to this, there are people who are beginner photographers, mm. there's people who have other careers who, who would like to be full-time professional photographers. Mm. And I think it doesn't matter where you are on that spectrum. The key thing to me, because uh, I agree with 100% of what you've said, is that a passion for the thing that you're shooting, you know, an absolute love and inquisitiveness and listening to that 16-year-old who allows you to be excited mm. about just doing stupid stuff sometimes. Um, but also not compromising your integrity, uh, hmm. not doing things that one, actually, especially that one is very important. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and not doing things just to make money because I, I was the same. I was in international finance for 20 years. Uh, so I, I had the big corporate sensible job as well. And if I wanted to make money, I would have stayed in international finance. Yes. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the, it is a lifestyle and it is a commitment to hmm. nature and conservation and, the planet and all of these big, big issues that we're all part of, really. So I think it's easy for people to look at someone like yourself who, who has a very impressive CV, not just in terms of your photographs, but the people who you work with, you know, the movie you made when the D850 was coming out. You know, you have a very, very professional and an amazing reputation in the industry. But to hear your sincerity and humility for nature and what it does for you as a person i think is a massive thing you know it, it's it says everything you need to know about marcel van Usten. <laughs> well how can i respond to that uh, yeah, no. uh, thank you very I, I just much i try silence for a moment <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you mentioned the, the, you mentioned the uh, what was it? what was the word integrity? Yeah. yeah, I think that's 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 very important. And actually, I think for uh, for people that just start out, that's kind of, that's that's super hard. Uh, when we started out, it was a different time because it was like before, basically before social media. It was before Facebook. It was before yeah. Instagram, and that has now become so important for so many people and. Um, you can instantly see, I, I don't even know, are you, for, like it, Instagram is different than Facebook, but especially on Instagram, when you, when you look there, it's so, I, I can imagine it's so hard for people to stick to, uh, to their own opinion and stick to their own routine and to what they like doing and not be persuaded to move into completely different directions because of what they see every day. Yeah. Because if you, if you follow like a couple of hundred people that you admire, a couple of hundred photographers that you think are really good, and you scroll through all the, through your feed and you see the amount of likes that certain images get and you start to recognize that certain photographers create a certain kind of work that has a certain look and you see that those images are all super popular 
I'm sure it becomes super tempting to also try something like that. Totally. And uh, be because everybody wants to be recognized and they want uh, the pet on their shoulder and they want to be more popular. And, uh, but I, I think it's, it's super important to, to analyze all that work and to try to understand why it's so popular and uh, what makes it so popular and then compare it to um, what drives you yourself and then decide whether this is something that you can use and whether, whether this actually fits in what you're doing or not. So to give you an example, I've seen, I've seen so many night shots where like the, like the Milky Way sky is like blue. It's like really, like really blue. And I'm like, it's not blue, you know, it's, it's not blue, it's never blue. No. The only time it's blue is when there's a full moon and that's the time when there's no Milky Way. No Milky Way. <laughs> so, <laughs> when there's a Milky Way and, and you're shooting with new moon, it's gonna be like no color in the sky. You're gonna have an amazing Milky Way, but it's just gonna, yeah. it's not gonna be colorful. But yet all the like the super uh, popular shots all have a lot of color and are bright and they're blue and usually at the horizon there's like this glow yeah. it's almost like a sunset glow that yeah. that uh, uh, that is like a gradient that goes morph morphs into the into the uh, the milky way and it and it drives me crazy and i found myself <laughs> one day when i was processing and then i was like this doesn't look like what i see on instagram <laughs> and it and that's that moment where you have to decide am i going to like move all the way to that side, or am I going to stick to, uh, to, a, to a more natural way of, uh, uh, to a more natural look? Um, I would be the first one to say that it doesn't matter because I think that uh, nature photography, any kind of photography almost is, is basically an art form. And in art, there should be no rules. So basically you, you decide what, what the rules are uh, for yourself. Uh, you're not, uh, Nobody should ask you um, to explain why you do what you do. You know, you're an artist, so you can you can make the sky any color that you want, sure. as long as long as you can still like sell it to yourself, as long as you can still uh, as it still fits uh, um, your own style and your own own reasons to do things. Um, and I I I just see on Instagram that just people just move. It's like you know, like like a, like a flock of starlings, you know, they all go one side and then suddenly one of the starlings decides to go to the left and then everybody goes to the left and suddenly photography has become like fashion. You know, you see all these, these, these styles evolve and they last for a little while and then suddenly it goes like this way and then it goes like that way. Um, that's, that, that's, that's very hard. And I, I think, I think this, um, this time that we live in now is very different from the time that we started out in because that one was very small. There were small communities like on Naturescapes where we, where we first met. Those were tiny communities right. where people like were constantly like giving feedback and asking you, asking you difficult questions to explain, yeah. to explain your own choices. Whereas now everything is so superficial and nobody asks you questions at all. Everything no. is like great work and like, or, uh, yeah, et cetera. So it's so superficial and uh, people are not, there's like, there's hardly any feedback, especially there's no negative feedback. I think that's the biggest, that's the biggest problem. Like uh, 10 years ago that you would still have a lot of forums where you get a ton of negative feedback, especially if you asked for it. And now there's like, there's like zero negative feedback. You just get a ton of likes because people think that if they give you the likes that you're going to like them back. And that's so it's, just, it's like this, this uh, popularity monster that's like totally out of control. Um, you're, you're yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a touch cynical there. <laughs> I don't know what I am. I, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm not a touch. I'm, I'm super, I'm, I'm, well, I'm, yeah, I think I'm cynical. Yeah. In, in many ways, well, I, yeah, I, I, think I, I, I more like it's not. It's more like uh, a realist. You know, I'm very realistic. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the same. I'm the I'm same. Very anal I'm very extremely analytical in what I in what I do and uh, in my way uh, looking at the world. Everything that I do, 
I think about I think about uh, my actions and um, so yeah I never do th stuff without thinking about it so that's also why I work so slow right. and it's also why it takes a long time before I decide what to do uh, it's because I just think everything over and over and over you know this is a a conversation that I feel we're just starting to scratch the surface of. I've got about another probably 50 things that have come into my mind <laughs> in the last five minutes that you've been talking about. Uh, would you be happy to do this again in a couple of months' time if we're still yeah, locked sure. up? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I think here, to try and keep it within the, the length of acceptability for people to listen to or watch, uh, we, we could close it just about here. That's where I have to correct you now. <laughs> but are you are you familiar with the podcast by Joe Rogan? Uh, yes, yeah. I, I, so I love those podcasts. Not all of them. It depends on the guests that he has. But those are like three hours. Yeah. And sometimes they go like up to like three and a half, sometimes four hours. Yeah, yeah. And, I'd, I'd need and, a big drink in front of me if we we're going to do that. <laughs> yeah, no. But the thing is, like, what I do, what I do when I go pro when I'm when I'm processing the the processing is actually uh, a lot of times actually very boring work, in a sense that it's you know what to do, so right. it, it doesn't involve a lot of thinking. And uh, I really enjoy listening to podcasts All right. in the background. Yeah. So what I do is when I start processing, I put on one of those podcasts. And if the guest is interesting and the subject is interesting, that's, that just means that I have like three hours worth of interesting <laughs> discussion that I can just listen to wow. And while I'm just processing. And um, to me, that's perfect. So that is, I've been doing that ever since I, I started in photography, always listening to uh, debates and, uh, and podcasts. That's really so interesting. I would, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I work in a completely different way. I mean, for me, I'll stick music on quite a lot of the time. And, hmm. um, you know, that has a big impact on, on maybe the creative direction that I'm going to go in. Because like we said, a lot of my processing is super quick. Whereas if I really do get into processing, then it's something I'm going to lose myself in and it's going to go right, in a yeah. direction that's going to be, it's going to be a surprise to me mm. at the end of it. Um, mm. So there's a lot less sort of methodical processing. But yeah, that's interesting. Well, we're going to try and keep them within the realms of um, <laughs> the sort of 45 minutes-ish. Um, and I know that we're, we're, we're looking at about an hour and 10 so far, but a lot of that was kind of, pre-meeting right, yeah. pre chat but there's certainly a bunch of things I'd love to carry on talking to you about because I think you know you're, you're like I said you're someone who I've had so much respect for for so many years and to speak to you and be able to ask you these questions and to get such detailed answers from you all it's done is reinforce pretty much what I felt about you uh, mm. so I, I think you've given a very good account of yourself and I've certainly thank you happy to hear that um, yeah. and well maybe one day we'll, we'll get to meet up with a, a, a more planned uh, agenda and we can mm. uh, we can go and do some shooting together and have a couple of beers and the shooting sounds great the beers I don't do oh right at all, <laughs> at all no oh very no. wise <laughs> no, it's nothing to do with wise. It's just uh, I hate it with a vengeance. So oh wow! Easy, it's easy to stay away from uh, from the alcohol. You're uh, you, well. You're you're the first sober Dutchman I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> I find it very hard to believe. <laughs> Not the Dutchman I've met. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right, Marcel. Well, so thank you very much for your time. It has been absolutely wonderful talking to you, and I wish you and Daniel. Thanks for having me. You're welcome, man. <laughs>